on this episode, Alexa, stop. <laughs> on this episode, the legend Danny Meyer stops by. Hey everybody, this is Gary Vaynerchuk and this is episode 280 of the Ask Gary V Show and I'm very excited, you know, I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna go right into it. Somewhere when I started ha- living somewhat of a public life, when I wrote a book called The Thank You Economy, I started getting random emails that made reference to my guest right now and, and maybe three years later we met each other in a panel in Columbus Circle and within 18 seconds, I'm like, oh my God, I'm gonna know this guy for the rest of my life, which is kind of like how I think about life quite a bit with people. Like, is this somebody I'm gonna know forever? Is this somebody I'm gonna kinda know? Is this somebody I'm never gonna talk to again? The war, I, and it is only now, and a lot of you following me who watch this, only in the last two months have I started using the word kindness. You know, as I try to really dissect why good things are happening to me and what I see is happening in the world, kindness as a business thing, because I do look through the world through an entrepreneurial lens, kindness is a word I finally use, and if you asked me to define this man with all the things he does that are very special, I would say he's kind, and that is the feeling I felt on that panel that day, uh, though I didn't use that terminology for a long time, it's so exciting for me, even though I've been doing this kind of Q&A show for a couple years, that only in the last 100 days have I finally gotten to that word and it feels very serendipitous that I get to deploy it because that's exactly what I felt. Danny, Danny Meyer, thank you so much for being on the show. Gary V, this is a big day for me. Uh, Why is that? Being on the show? Yeah, being on your show. just randomly something cool is going on. And no, I've got to just say the same thing. When you and I, you and I were on a very improbable panel together in Columbus Circle, it was two people who I knew I wanted to meet but I knew a lot about the one guy, Jacques Pepin. Legend. You want to talk about a weird salad dressing? Gary Vaynerchuk, <laughs> yeah. Jacques Pepin, and Danny Meyer. It was amazing. Right? And, and it uh, worked, by the way. And it worked. We had a great host that day, yes, Rob Rosenthal. We sure did. Yeah. He did a good job. But anyway, and then you and I got together at Gramercy Tavern yes. and at 11 Madison Park. And yes. I think we've explored that um, while our professional paths are quite different, it's almost like the very same things that ring your bell ring my bell. I think that's right. And we may name them different things. And like you're you're arriving at the use of the word kindness, but you didn't just start being kind. No. That was instilled, you know, very early on DNA-wise and, and absolutely, uh, whether you want to call it manipulated, but I would think curated unbelievably well by my mom. And it just became my being. And it's really funny because I do think we have a ton of similarities. And the people that know us best, I think, really know that. I do think I have a personality trait that, you know, outwardly speaks to an aggressiveness and a style that I think some have to get. You know, one of the things I judge people based on how they react to me, you know, I just, I remember just, wow, this guy really gets it. You and know what he, I always admired you? Think about how much money you personally save by not having to buy caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good amount of money. It is a solid, at least 30, now in today's day, you know, in today's day and age of what coffee costs, it probably is a yeah. solid amount. Yeah, I mean, I'm very energetic naturally, but I will say gratitude is a big driver for me. I'm very acutely aware of how good I have it, and I don't mean today. I mean, you know, my mom and dad both lost a parent before they were 15. And uh, you know, I haven't gone into this subject matter with my, my team either. I, between them telling me the war stories of growing up in Soviet Russia, between them both losing a parent, and I will tell you, I was very affected, probably until I was 25 years old, with the thought of losing my parents. And even, I would only argue, until my kids got a little older did I feel it transition. But I always, I love my parents so much, much more than most people I know that I've always been grateful for them. They're very different, they brought me different things. But, and my circumstance, even though we didn't have a whole lot and we were poor than lower middle class than middle class than middle to upper middle class, um, it, compared to the world I live in now, it was nothing. But I was also so grateful compared to what my parents had. And so gratitude is, I, I'm, I believe this, besides well, I my natural- the first, the first time please. we met, what you spoke about the most, this was back when the biggest thing people knew about Gary V was selling wine mm-hmm. through videos. That was it. 
not that that was a little thing, but what you shared with me over and over again was that you wanted to help your dad break out. Yeah. And that somehow this was your calling in terms of how you were going to do it. Yeah. And then I remember one other time, you were the person that convinced me to go on Twitter. Do you remember you took out your phone and you said, you need at DH Meyer and you got to figure out how to do this thing. And all you have to do this, your advice, it it rung true. We're sitting at Gramercy Tavern one day. I remember like yesterday. And you, and you go, all you have to do is this. Don't be afraid of it. Just read, curate, curate your own magazine. People you really want to read, just read, read, read. And if you feel like you have to say something, just say, thank you. It was, that's what you told me a million years ago. It was super interesting to me. There's been a couple people, uh, that I knew I was giving a piece of advice that was so in them and the only thing stopping to th- them was the way they perceived something. There was nothing more obvious to me that, that you were gonna be tremendous at it because it was your natural demeanor. Twitter at its best is a listening platform. You are great at what you do because you macro listen to your employees, to the market, to the consumer. You're a listener. There's a reason we all have two ears and one mouth. I love it. Cliche. On the other hand, there's a problem. So, we all have 10 digits. <laughs> <laughs> Danny, listen, I think we are off and running out of admiration. Please, for the 18 people, actually, you know what? With a lot of 22-year-old entrepreneurs from all over the world, this is an audience that I think some, I would love for them, you know, in your quickest, you know, first issue of the comic book origin story, give me a minute or two of like who you are. Who I am and what I do are completely different things. Give me both. In one respect, I'm known as a restaurateur, but I think who I am is a citizen and a dad and a husband. And, you know, I I really go about my life with one philosophy. Um, I go about my life with something I learned in my summer camp from the time I was 10 years old till I was a counselor at the age of 17. And that's leave your campsite neater than you found it. Hmm. It's kind of simple. I wish I wish I could make it more complicated. We're all we all are fortunate enough to at Citizen. least have been born into a family, whatever the circumstances sure. may have been, and we all have an opportunity to leave things a little bit better than we found them. It's funny you say that. Literally, I had a really interesting interview last week, and they asked me what I wanted my tombstone to say, and I said that I gave more than I took, and it feels very it. similar to that. It's the exact same thing. So what I do is that I'm in the restaurant business. And my first restaurant is Union Square Cafe, which I opened when I was 27 years old. And then not for 10 years after that did I open a second restaurant, which was Gramercy Tavern. And then they kind of started flowing. I kind of looked at restaurants almost the way an author would look at a new novel. And while it took me 10 years to write a second one, Gramercy Tavern, four years later, there were two right off the bat, 11 Madison Park and Tabla. And then there was the modern and blue smoke and then a little one called Shake Shack. We didn't open a second Shake Shack for five years. And then restaurants like Myelino and North End Grill and Untitled and Blue, I already talked about Blue Smoke. We have a company, our biggest company is, is one that consumers may not have heard about, but it's our biggest company. It's called Union Square Events. And Union Square Events does huge events and parties. We also do the food in ballparks, which we haven't, we haven't started serving yet uh, where, the, where your beloved Jets play. That's right. I don't eat during the game. We're in ballparks and arenas all over the place. We serve the food in business class on Delta, transcontinental, as well as to Europe. And really having a lot of fun there. Hey, let, me, let, me get, let me get selfish, which I like to do once in a while. You have such a nice guy persona. Like that's just established, everybody knows it, like everybody here and it's in a room that's our fans, the people that know you that are watching. Obviously for everybody listening, I'm selfish because my number one agenda in the short term with entrepreneurs that follow me is to teach patience and you've deployed it. And I think that's something you and I really share quite a bit and we talked on it once, maybe the last two, I feel like two times ago we talked about it for a few minutes in passing. We really are similar. I mean, I. I ran a liquor store for the first 13 years of my career. You know, like I and I've and I've been running Vayner Media. Obviously, I've been producing a lot of content and playing that game. But I always thought it was super interesting that a company of the size, my my perceived belief of the size of Shake Shack, what it represents, what it invoked in the QSR and kind of fast casual, whatever you want to call it, you know, technicality wise. But it opened up people's eyes of like, wait a minute is Burger King McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken, Mm. like clearly there's going to be an evolution that was, you know, because just the scale of the quality that you guys deliver on. 
I wanna ask you an interesting question because I think you're extremely pro-employee, which I'm very passionate about. I think you have this incredible image. I don't know this because I don't consume a lot of stuff. Maybe the New Yorker did a profile or maybe this has been addressed. I've always secretly, and we've never had this dinner, we've never really hung out for a weekend. The part that I'm curious about is how competitive do you think you are? Enormously. So to me, that's my sense, right? Like when I look at you, I'm like, I love this guy, right? He's the best dude and he's doing all the right things, but he's like a sweet assassin. Let, let's talk about how oh, sweet assassin. That's that's kind of how, that's like if you asked well, me here, to do word association. Thing. I want to confront that one. Okay, for a please. Second. I'm, I think about competitive spirit a lot because I need to surround myself just as you do, and I can feel it the minute I come into your office. You got to surround yourself with people who want to be champions. Yes. Otherwise, why like, go what to are we work? Doing it? What's the point? especially going to work for yourself. Yes. So I've kind of come down to understanding competitive spirit in this way. There are four kinds of competitors, and I think it's a really, really important thing to try to figure out where you are in the spectrum. The first one, and by the way, there's not a right or wrong here. Yeah, these are just your four. The first one is a competitive. You don't really care if you win or you lose. I have an uncle who I adore who just happy to go to work every day and collect his paycheck and he's a great dad and husband and uncle but he doesn't really want to go is that not competitive at all he's a competitive like like asexual like just yeah not competitive that's what i meant okay and so that's way number one that's not even in the competitive bracket right it 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 is because i think you need to have non-competitive to understand competitive so now you've got three kinds of competitors go ahead and I think it's really important to look in the mirror and know who you are along these ways. Self-awareness. Self-awareness. So the first one is the guy who competes primarily with the motivation of beating someone else. And that really gets them excited. Yep. Who did I beat Yep. to win? Number three, because A competitive yep. is number yep. one. Number three is the person who is primarily motivated to compete because... They hate to lose. Just like there's just nothing worse than than that. Yep. And then the fourth one is like the great high jumper in the Olympics who competes themselves to outdo their own personal best. They yep. don't care who they beat. They don't yep. care about losing. What they care about is how can I do a little bit better tomorrow than I did yesterday. Yep. And again, there's not... There's not a wrong one believe, amongst you them. You believe people blend a little bit, probably, right? I, I do, but I think I feel that like I, if, when I hear that, I'm like, I blend a little bit. Like, the third one's super interesting to me. Well, think think about, you, you may or may not blend as much as you think you do. Maybe, maybe. Think about yourself as a sports fan. Yes. And It's think, all about the climb for me. Okay. So for me, as a sports fan, and I agree with you, that's where I go with this. You haven't had much experience with the Jets. <clears throat> no, of climbing. or the Knicks. Or the, well, no, I've had a ton of experience of the climb with those two. Okay. It's the journey. So, I find it interesting that I dropped the Yankees and the Rangers literally the moment they won, like 24 hours after they won a championship. Mission accomplished. Energy deployed to the ones that are missing. I'm, I've now been a, you know, basically for 20 years, I've been a Knicks and Jets fan. AJ's 11 years younger than me. He's only a Knicks and Jets fan because basically ever since he's been old enough, I've been pushing him on those two because the Yankees and Rangers won in 94, 96. So that's me as a fan. Then I think of myself when I play my bad pickup basketball or bad tennis. I'm unbelievably competitive and want to like hurt feelings. Like I love looking at Phil and Trout and knowing they've never beat me in tennis and it feels great and I like to call it out and we should probably find Nate. He's never be- beat me either. <laughs> you, remember, you remember that great photograph, classic photograph of Muhammad Ali lording over Sonny Liston of course. who was just knocked of course. out? I think he loved the fact that he beat Sonny Liston. You know, I is that li- you? I don't listen. I like winning, but here's I, I don't know. The pro- you know what's funny? I know a lot about Muhammad Ali because my one of my best friends in the world was his godson, so I know certain things about him. I would say yes, but let me tell you why. I would love nothing more than to beat Trout this summer, which I'm sure we're gonna play six nothing and make it uncomfortably not competitive and like razz him on the court and like talk about like why would he let me 10 years older and I'm always working and he doesn't work as hard as me and yet I'm still beating him six, I would love that. But then literally the second that match ends and we're drinking water and walking back to the house, I wanna know like, is his relationships going well? How's his sis? Like what's, like I'm a very 
extreme version of very competitive on the court, but then the guy you wanna have a beer with right after, like I really, really, when I compete, am quite like, t- like a totally different person. Um, yeah, I, I I hear that, I, and I and I can relate to that. I, I'd say that I'm in. I, I there's almost none of me that's a competitive. There's there's yeah. there's no there's completely none either. of me. I don't there's, understand that. There's, life there's almost none of me that competes because I love crushing the other person. Yeah, there's a big part of I me like that hates to lose. Other, I hate to. I don't. You know, it's funny. They the the two, three, and four, or what have you. Like, they all like have like I love razzing because in a weird way I love motivating. So like a lot of my content, a lot of what I do, I love motivating. Like I, I love to be a head coach in a lot of ways. You know, I'm just gonna own the team and do it that way. But you know, like, so I like trying to figure out which triggers, everyone's motivated differently. Right. Like secretly I want Trout to finally beat me in tennis. There's a little part of me. I don't let it happen, but there's a little part of me. I think this is gonna be the summer. This is gonna be it for you, Trouty. Danny, what, um. Before we segue a little bit, I, I actually actually talk to me about this because this is I want to show this. This is ridiculous. Like Jordan, please make sure you're not watching. So this is obnoxious. This looks super good. Trout and and Phil literally live there. I hear all my employees mention this place every day. Where is it? Like I'm the worst. I don't know anything. Well, what is the it we're even talking about? I don't even. I can't see this. Let's you mean you can't you can't see your oh organization? My God, look at this too. Where's the rest? Where's the place? Where's Daily? Where okay, is it located? Da- daily Provisions. Yes. Fascinating story. First of all, I hope that, I don't think I've ever said this before, but yes. I, I hope Daily Provisions will, will one day be the kind of place that a lot more people have access to than the one that we have, which is conveniently tucked right next door to Union Square Cafe. That bite you took should have just changed your life. It's well, really fucking good, man. <laughs> that's called a cruller, Gary. So here, here's the deal with Daily Provisions. It tastes like butter just directly went into my body in the no. best way possible. Actually, actually, almost no butter whatsoever. Really? Lots of eggs. Yeah, okay, fine. Think about that. I think about the same eggs way. And, eggs and oh. air. That's what you just ate. Eggs, I air with eggs. a dusting of cinnamon on top. Especially eggs that taste like butter. So anyway, daily provision. <laughs> in the same way that Shake Shack was an accident, it, yep. it was born out of being a hot dog cart to take care of a park, and yep. then all of a sudden, five years later, it became Shake Shack. That's what's going to happen here. We'll see what happens. This was an accident. Daily Provisions was an accident. We were designing the new Union Square Cafe because we lost our lease yep. on the original one after 30 years. Yep. And the space we found, which used to be called City Crab, came with a little barbecue dive bar Go called, ahead, called Duke's. And so Duke's was right next Not door. Mine. And we went, how in the world are we going to put this little space to good use? Tiny. This space is about twice as big as your office, the one we're sitting in right now. And so we came up with this idea and we said, let's give a gift to the neighborhood. That was our mantra. What does this neighborhood want more of that it doesn't have? That was pretty easy. An amazing bakery. We don't have one in the neighborhood. Amazing coffee. Great sandwiches, breakfast, lunch, and a damn good rotisserie chicken for dinner. That's all it is. And since the place is so small, the next mantra after let's give a gift to the neighborhood was if you are going to get a place on the menu at Daily Provisions, we have to believe that you are a category killer. If you're not, you don't get to be on the menu. So when you taste the Schnecken here, which is Schnecken, Schnecken is German for snail. Or right, go ahead. You might call Who wants that a Schnecken? A, All right, yeah. Go ahead. That just made the menu this week. Turn it over. You'll see why it's called a Schnecken. That's a snail right there. Um, that just made the menu this week. and Because it finally became a category killer. It became the it, best it, schneck in, it, it in the game. It did. And the that's roast, how you think about it. That's the only thing. So if it's there, whether it's a bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich in the morning. That's an awfully tough category. Go have one. Anyone here? You've been there 20 times. You ever had the bacon, egg, cheese sandwich? Yeah? But there's some real fucking bacon, egg, and cheese sandwiches out there in the world. Okay, we're going to compete. We'll go, go in that bracket any day. There's been a lot of upsets in March Madness. <laughs> I don't know what your bracket looks like, but mine is a disaster. I had a rhino pooping as a gift. I, I Do you saw, see that? Gary, you saw that? I, I thought that was, that was amazing. Good, right? I mean, like my bracket is the, the thing all was, time that bad. rhino never ran out of poop <laughs> Never, either. it kept going. <laughs> Let's get to the first question, actually, while we keep talking about this. So this was an accident, now it's real. It's not, and a, it's, it's and, my favorite kind of accident because it's the kind what's of. What's this? That's called a queenamon, and queen-a-mon. Real, real many queenamons. Okay. 
I like Queen but of Hearts. You got to break it down the center. Don't you know? None let's, of this. Okay, let's sorry, let's get off light. the edges yeah. and all that kind well, of I'm stuff. Well, I'm an edge eater. Okay, have the edge then. Enjoy okay. it. What do you guys think of the Schnecken? Is what I want to know. Out of control. It's out, what did you, you say? Love it? Out of control. Out of control. Let's I love do it. that. Who's first? Reed Armstrong, DC. Reed in DC. Yep. How many Shake Shacks are there now? 167, 168 they'll open tomorrow in Denver. First one in Actually, Denmark Wednesday in Denver. You have some in Denver already, right? That'll Reed be number Armstrong. one. What was it? Reed. Reed? Hey, Reed, it's Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary? You're on with Danny Meyer and I. How are you? Doing well. How you guys doing? Good. How's DC? Oh, you know it's it's not New York, but we're uh, we're holding our own. Danny, it'll be a lot better when uh, you open up shop here. Well, I can't I, wait till that happens someday. You have uh, no, you have nothing in DC. We have um, seven Shake Shacks in the DC area, and they're great. DC's been an amazingly warm market for us, but we don't have any full service restaurants there. Hopefully, one day we'll have Union Square Cafe in, in Washington DC. Love it. What's your question, my friend? Absolutely, absolutely incredible to see you guys together. Danny, actually, the, the pleasure of cooking for you as a stage at, at Roses. Uh, and Gary, you'll appreciate that. Um, you have completely changed my game, and this is my last week at my current uh, job before I switch gears in industry and jump into the restaurant biz. So, Amazing, man. Danny, Thank my, you. Uh, my, my question for you is, is widely considered one of the most successful and influential restaurant tours in the world. Uh, I really enjoyed your New York Times interview in January on the future of restaurants. So building off of some of those themes, how do you take care of your staff and your customers? And on top of that, uh, because of the power and emotion of food, what responsibility do you feel restaurants should have in taking care of their larger community? That's a big, big question. Um, and I, I got uh, the probably the best answer I can give you is we have so much responsibility. You, you nailed something, Reed, when you talked about the emotional connection to food. It took me a number of years when I was a young restaurateur to understand why when we let someone down, it could actually motivate them to write a three-page complaint letter. And because I'd go like, I mean, how overcooked could the salmon be? Or how oversalted could the, the pasta be? And I finally realized, and you nailed this, that food and love and the provision of food and love are so inextricably linked, as MFK Fisher wrote, that it's not about did we overcook your salmon, it's did we, did we dish you? And that's how a lot of people feel. And that's why they also love the restaurants they love so much, because they get the love that maybe they didn't get somewhere else in their lives. So too, do the, so too do communities feel that way when you open a restaurant. So too do employees feel that way. Restaurants, as you know, are places that when you work there, you feel a sense of family, adjunct to your own family. And sometimes restaurant families are deemed to replace what you didn't get from your own family. And so why are employees so happy when they're happy and so unhappy when they're unhappy? It all comes down to the very topic. We're, we're not a widget factory. I'm not saying widget factories can't be emotional too, but restaurants are about food and love. Just don't make any mistake about it. That makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, I think... I also think about <clears throat> the percentage of time two groups of people use, which is in major cities, I mean, let's talk about New York, and this is why New York has this relationship with restaurants. You know, what percentage of time people, and obviously there's technology changes with some of the delivery services, so that you've seen some slight change in this, but an enormous amount of time spent in restaurants. There are plenty of New Yorkers, if they're not traveling, who spend most, Three fourths of their nights in well, a sure, restaurant. Sure, because in Manhattan. if you think about the it's average pretty. square footage that a New Yorker takes up in terms of where they spend their sleeping and and waking hours, it's smaller than in many many other communities, and therefore restaurants provide kind of an adjunct living room to. It's why I think everything that the else you do in your life with restaurants in New York is a little bit different than even other major cities You're in New York right. because of that. Yep. Reed, thanks for calling, man. Thank you, guys. Take care. And good luck with your, so what, so what are you doing? Give me a little 411. So you're starting next week doing what? Yeah, so I'm, I'm joining uh, Kava Grill. So I'm gonna be heading up a lot of their R&D. So I've always had a passion in uh, food service and restaurants and, and made the jump and left my uh, desk job and I'm gonna be um, working on menu development for that. I, and I just gotta yeah. jump in and say, I'm a huge admirer of that company and I congratulate you for joining them. It's awesome, man, good luck. Let's move on. Thanks. So Danny, how, 
you know, and I know you're gonna go humble here, so I'm gonna try to create a framework for you not to by saying it. How does it feel to be so at top of a craft like you are right now, right? I mean, like, look, if you were an athlete, you would be an easy first ballot Hall of Famer, right? Like, you, you know, it, the first call makes a reference. I have a funny feeling one or two others will. You know, you really, really are. You know, for a lot of people that understand this industry, uh, you know, somebody who's inspired them to do their own thing, changed, you've changed a lot of uh, people's behaviors within their own restaurants. And, and the admiration you have from the industry is extremely high. That comes with its own circumstances. Uh, you know, I'm sure, you know, there's people that push back to your, you know, you push forward thinking ideas that, you know, I'm sure some have been uh, accepted differently than others. But, you know, as you just hit your 60th birthday, right, have you started, you know, I know you're thinking ahead, you know, I, you know, I have the luxury of spending a lot of time with the winners of 60, 70, 80 year old craft and there's very little looking back at times but there's some, I mean even, you know, I think it's a human thing. Some people even in their 30s are doing it. How do you think about the fact that you've been able to achieve this kind of, you know, stamp legacy in an industry that is so culturally relevant? It, it, must, be, it must be humbling and, and feels good. Where are you at with, your, with that part of your life? Well, I, I thank you for what you just said. I'll, I'll take it in, and it certainly feels good. But I will tell you, without any false modesty, that for whatever reason, my wiring is that if you give me a compliment or you give a compliment to my team or my colleagues, what we do is we dig in and we try even harder. Sure. And, you know, I was talking earlier about competitive spirit. If we get a bad review, and we've had many, because I, I think we ask to be held to a higher standard. We get more complaint letters probably than most other restaurant companies. 100%. You've created permission. We have created, we, we invite it. And, uh, and you I know totally what? I totally understand it. If you go out, well, think about, think about your sports teams. If you won last year, the only answer is to win even more games this year. Ungrateful and if you don't fans. do that, you're going to let your fans in. Well, ungrateful Boston fans. That's what that there, sounds like to you me. You know what? We don't consider anyone ungrateful. As a matter of fact, I kind of welcome being held to a higher standard. Totally but understand. This is the deal. This is, I know how I'm wired, which is that the minute you start believing in your own success, you You're may finished. as well just You're hang finished. it up. And it's, so, it's absolutely true. I don't believe, look, if but you I, want. Don't you feel like you can hold those contradictory feelings I, I, in? I, I can. I yeah. can walk into my office sure. and see 28 James Beards yeah. hanging on the wall yeah, of our like, office and shit. say, somehow that happened. <laughs> yeah. So someone said you guys were doing yep. a good job. Yep. But when we go to work every day, all of us. That I understand. We honor the work we did yesterday, but we dig in and we ask ourselves how can we do it even better today and that's what i love that's you're talking about the journey i always want to be on that upward journey and we're never going to reach it and that's okay do you think you'll work until you die well it's funny i was just having a conversation this morning with my wife about that (laughs) having (laughs) having having come off of a uh a weekend of birthday celebrations and i cannot imagine ever not working because it's brain and heart food you're just learning, 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 competing. That's what I love to do. Now, what I do love more than anything at this stage of my career is surrounding myself with champions and giving them the ball. And increasingly, I'm transitioning from being a guy who had to be the, the producer, the director, the lead actor, the screenwriter. I just want to be the producer. Danny? Greg? Greg? Hey. Yep. Hey, it's, hey. Gar- it's Gary Vaynerchuk and Danny Meyer. How are you? Good, good. How are you? Amazing. What's your question? Uh, all right. So, um, first of all, big fans. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. So, uh, my wife and I started a food kind of Instagram page about five, six years ago called Devour Power. Devour um, Power. Devour very, Power. Yep, I'm aware yeah. of it. Phil Toronto from Toronto Tartar is very excited. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Dee Simone's it. excited. Yeah, you so got some fans here, brother. <laughs> What's up, guys? <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's grown to over like 500,000 followers now. About two years ago, we started a marketing and media company. Understood. Um, I, I, met Gary, I met Gary V when he only had a million uh, followers. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You're getting there. All right. So, my question is... Um, in today's market, having a strong social media presence with engaging content is definitely a leading factor 
in being successful as a restaurant. With that being said, having traditional PR, like getting an eater and Grub Street, et cetera, is important as well. Where do you think the future of restaurant marketing is heading? And in the coming years, will restaurants steer more of their marketing budget towards social media as opposed to the high-priced PR agencies that don't really focus on social media? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in first because I'm curious to see where Danny takes it, where I, where this framework. So it was funny, as you were talking, having a social media presence, uh, you know, a successful one, as a leading indicator, I, you know, I don't necessarily believe that. I think that when I look at the, as of today, and it could change over time, but when I look today at a lot of the top restaurants, um, you know, uh, Danny's firm's uh, uh, investment arm is a very large investor in Resi. He, he's an icon in technology and restaurants as being an early supporter and board member of Open Table. I've, with Resi, starting a couple years ago with Ben, I've looked heavier at the restaurant marketing world than I would have naturally. Um, I do not believe that a lot of the top restaurants in this country have very strong social media presence. Um, I think if you're going from zero and trying to establish something today, starting today, it's a really nice thing to have, to have an Instagram presence that matters and some other things. Um, but I think it's very interesting. Here's, and this is a huge parallel to the wine world. I think the greatest thing that has ever happened to the wine world is that Robert Parker and Wine Spectator, two individuals with Marvin Schenken and two entities, Wine Advocate and Wine Spectator, that I have enormous respect for and thought did a lot of good for the wine business in the 80s and 90s in America when it was needed. I think the best thing that has happened to the wine world over the last decade is things that Wine Library TV started, which was technology would create a more wide point of view where one or two people couldn't make and break a winery. I would tell you that what you're doing, what a lot of great startups are doing uh, in, uh, in the marketplace, what social media is doing in the marketplace, I think has been a great thing. Does the New York Times review still matter? Of course it does. Does it matter the way it did 13 years ago? I do not believe it does, given all the different variables that I see in the marketplace. And I would tell you, and this is a very personal thing for me, I think people are very confused um, around the fact that if I was, I think that what scares me when you frame it that way is that I'm always scared that marketing, AKA sizzle, AKA marketing, if you're in the restaurant business and I did your marketing for you, I would do it better than anybody. I really genuinely believe that. If I was hired to do the marketing for your restaurant tomorrow and it's what I did full time, it would be the most successfully marketed restaurant in America. If your service and your food sucked shit, all that would happen is I would speed up the process of people knowing we suck and we would lose. And so, you know, for me, the, a restaurant business, or me as a person, the reason I think I run a successful company is not because I'm a personality or good at marketing, it's what happens next after you get people into the funnel. And so, look, I, you know, to answer your question directly, I think a traditional PR company is basically out of business in 2018. They just don't realize it yet. You cannot be in the business of hitting up editors and networks to get your guest on or awareness in a world where we can all go direct to consumer at scale. So to answer directly, traditional PR companies that charge $5,000, $3,000, $10,000 a month to a human or to a restaurant and think getting articles on websites or getting an appearance on a morning talk show, that game is over. And over the next decade, they will be transformed into a very different service. Um, but, I, but I also think it, you need to be very careful you know, if I see a restaurant have 1.3 million followers on Instagram and good engagement even, I don't default into thinking they have a good restaurant business. I think they have a better potential for a great restaurant business, but it's gonna really matter how that steak is delivering on that social media sizzle. What Danny, he said. You agree? I couldn't agree more. In fact, we've made that same shift in our company. We used to have, as recently as probably five years ago, 80% of our internal Span and, and we, we have an internal team that is second to none. Yep. But 80% of it was on public relations. Yep. Today, 80% of it's on social media. Yep. How Makes do we, sense. and marketing. Yep. Not just social media, but how do we tell our story direct as opposed to asking scale. other people to tell it for us? I mean, us? I very personally, one, one selfish objective I have here is to somehow get you to start a podcast. 
like a meaningful one. Like it would dominate. You would have a top 100 pod. Your podcast, and you would only have to do it once. It's funny you should say that. I have a meeting right after this because my own team is begging for the same thing. But my answer, I mean, here's my answer. For 10 years before I wrote Setting the Table, yes. I was hearing, you got to write a book, you got to write a book. Yeah. And I said, we already have cookbooks now. No, we don't want a recipe that leads to food. We want a recipe for how you guys do business. What do people need to hear in a podcast that doesn't already exist, Gary? I'll explain. So we're going to go reenact our Twitter moment, you and I. Okay, I'm, in, I'm in there. In a podcast form. I think much like you've created the framework for passing the ball and being the, you don't have to do all the things, a podcast around your points of view slash your organization's points of view to the industry is remarkably impactful not only to the industry but to industries outside of your industry. I think the thing that's super interesting to me when I wrote The Thank You Economy was like somebody who owns a construction company would be like the two formative books in my life. And you know, it's funny with books, people read them in all out of order style, you know, it doesn't matter when they're printed. You know, sometimes when I get asked, um, they're like another one, you know, I'm like, I don't know, Dandy's book. Like, like to me, when they want to double down on that thesis, my belief is that podcasts are enormously important culturally. People, you have to understand, you have to be, cre- you have to create things in a way that people want to consume them. There are millions of people that you could be impacting professionally and personally who only consume information in who podcast aren't pick form. Up setting Correct. The table, right. And what I love, what I love is that it doesn't have to require a lot of your time. What you've done extremely well and and is exactly the telltale sign of a true leader and somebody who's a true citizen is you've not made this just about yourself. And you, you're, you're even incapable over the last 10 years, you know, like even everything is we, it, it, you know, it's so ingrained into you that the we, the team, the this, that the fact that you can have a daily podcast that can be hosted by a different team member every day of the week. And I think you think of the world the way I do, which is I don't mean the head of business relations or the head of PR. I mean somebody who's back office, somebody who's front of one of the restaurants, somebody who's been at you know, Shake Shack for two weeks in DC. Um, I, think, I think if you really thoughtfully thought of a framework, you could create a very impactful piece of media that would disproportionately uh, help people and help whatever objectives you had, whether that's business or culturally or whatever it may be. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Brother, thanks for the call. Anything else you want to, while we're pontificating here and being ideological? I, did, I didn't know I was being invited in for a therapy <laughs> session, but this is really helpful. Uh, thanks. What are you looking to do? Are you looking to, are, uh, the way you asked the question, are you trying to build more ammo to be able to get clients in that world and you want to be a service provider for restaurants and, and convince them properly, in my opinion, that them spending $6,000 a month with you is a hell of a lot better than the $6,000 a month they're spending elsewhere? Uh, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the goal is to grow devour power as big as it could possibly be as an influencer with me and my wife, and then also have the media marketing company as well, helping out restaurants, because uh, that's what we love to do. I love it, man. Well, good luck. Thanks for calling in. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Danny, I'm going to Martina tonight, so I'm pretty pumped about it. That's awesome. And they which, better deliver. which is the name of your reservation, just so we can snag it? <laughs> he it? wants your last Thank name, bro. You. Oh, oh, Remy, R-E-M-M-E-Y. All right, you we got, got it. it. Thanks, brother. That's just how I ask. Like, give me your fucking last name. That's how I do it, Danny. <laughs> All right, let's get to the next one. Danny, podcast. Yeah. Like, look how excited your team is. They want it bad. Team, you want the podcast, right? Yeah, they're thumbs thumbs up over there. I like that. It would. Re- How often do you have to do that? So I do it really weird. This is very rare for me to take time to do it. I I've, I've gone very extreme. I've like I've like filmed myself at all times, and we strip audio from it, and then that becomes the podcast. Got it. Um, but I've been giving. But there's a lot of things going on. Like John and Nate, I'm thinking about doing some wine stuff. But Phil wants. Hey, to like, this is Justin. Uh, Justin, how are you? It's Gary Vee, and you're here um, with Danny Meyer. Yes, what's up, guys? What is up? First of all, you guys are killing me with the pastries. Everyone looks so good, and Queenie Mons are my absolute favorite, so I'm very, very jealous of you both right now. But you but you are a Patriots fan. No, 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 no. Pastries. Oh, pastries. pastries. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a I thought he said I was waiting for that. Got it. That's the best joke of the week that, that just I mean, happened. That's just where my it. head's at. No pro- yeah, the, we'll send you some. Danny will, Danny's really good at this stuff. We're going to get your information and send you cases. Guys, of guys, you, you yeah. got, you, hold, hold on to your question. You promise? Yes. He's, yeah, he won't you, forget. You, you, got, you got to hear this story. Go you just go. gave me with the pastry and patriots. Go. 
I will never forget one day I get a very, very angry call. This was a long time ago when everybody got their restaurant recommendations from the Red Zagat survey. Yes, I remember. And, and this guy calls me on the phone. He says, I am so angry. I can't even tell you. And I said, what, what, what happened? He said, I traveled two hours to get to Gramercy Tavern because in the back of the book, in the back of the Zagat survey, there's a category that says game in season. And you're in it. And I got there and there was no TV. I wanted to watch the Bears. <laughs> That's, That's amazing. Right. You're like, you didn't want some pheasant? No, <laughs> I mean. Wasn't that, huh? Love it. That's pretty fucking awesome. Uh, the Bears and Jets play this year in Chicago. Early prediction, 19 Jets, 13 Bears. Just document it. Without free agency completed and preseason, I'm feeling confident. All right, back to the question. Sorry, go ahead. Totally. So this is actually a great piggyback off of the previous question about social media. I've worked at a lot of places that do uh, experience-focused dining, tasting menus, Michelin restaurants. What is the best way to leverage either social media or voice or the internet for that style of restaurant? Uh, like the restaurant that's already killing it with their steak, but they could really take it to the next level with some marketing sizzle. And more importantly, who should be doing the posting? I know a lot of restaurants don't have like, and so quote unquote, like, social I'll, media managers. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. So you are of the mindset that you've worked at or currently work in organizations that are delivering on the quality and, and I understand the framework of the restaurant, but haven't, haven't accelerated its growth because it's either not getting the proper respect in the marketplace, mar- you know, PR or, or natural word of mouth, uh, and you're looking for an angle in marketing to bring a little bit more awareness because you believe once you can bring those people in, the 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 acceleration will happen as long as people can taste that steak. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And you know, like making sure that the the Tuesday reservations are just as booked as the Friday Saturday reservations. What what town are you in? Because that's a variable. Uh, so I'm in Seattle right now, but my previous job was in Europe in Norway, and I actually like I created the Snapchat account for that restaurant. And I was like a super big push on, on social media, but the, it was hard to convince those people because it's like, well, who does the posting? How do you word that? Um, what's yeah, real, I think what's maybe real, it might help. What's really fascinating is I don't think people know this, but Norway is Snapchat's most interesting market globally. It is their deepest penetration of any market. Hmm. Is that why you did Snapchat? Because it was just very obvious to you. Like the 35 to 50 year old crowd on Snapchat in Norway is actually very high. Hmm. Is that what you totally. saw as well? And, well, kind of. This was back when you were you were very bullish on Snapchat. <laughs> so you were like Gary like says, do it. So I'll do you remember it. the time you collared <laughs> well, me on Snapchat down at South by Southwest? Saw that was the best. <laughs> um, so look, I mean, listen. It's this. You know, I think what you're talking about is an institution that looks down on modern communication, right? Your issue was right. was it's this new thing, and they got the, what really happened in your scenario that you're painting is that there's a level of disrespect of the quality of that attention because I promise you, if the owners of any establishment thought of it the way I thought of it, they wouldn't get hung up on who's posting. If you actually think it's gonna impact your business, if that's what your objective is, well then all of a sudden you're gonna allocate the resources. Let me tell you one thing about restaurants and any other business, follow the money. I love when people talk to me, like business owners or entrepreneurs, and they talk about things, but then when you look at their actions based on their financial allocations, they are talking a very different game. So you can be bullish all you want about social media, but if you're allocating 8% of your budget to it, then you don't really think it's that serious. You, you wanna not look stupid in society when it's finally been accepted, but you don't believe that it's driving your business. I mean, to answer your question directly, it's all storytelling. If you want to tell people about your oxtail soup, you've got to tell them about your oxtail soup. 40 years ago, that was whatever book or one or two critics in the neighborhood, then it was the Times, then it was Michelin, then it was Zagat, then it was Google. You know, now it's social. Tomorrow it will be Alexa. You know, hey Alexa, what's the best Hey Alexa, what's the best oxtail soup? Stick with me here right Sorry, now. Sorry. I don't know that. Good. Hey Alexa, what's the best spaghetti in New York City? So what's interesting is, you see those two examples, what excites me is I'm gonna make a video in 24 months that I'm gonna ask those same two questions and it's gonna answer and it's gonna answer it really interestingly and really well or subjective or we'll see. But the fact that we're here now, hey Alexa, what's the best restaurant in New York City? Here are a few top rated restaurants in New York City. Mm. Right, so this is going off of Yelp, right? 
And it's super arbitrary. What's going to happen now is that hey, Alexa, they, you need to eat out more often. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, what I would say is whatever is the technology of the time. What's exciting for me is, you know, I'm look. I look through things through other people's eyes. I can see from the corner of my eye Danny now taking his fourth look at the Alexa. He's a competitive ninja, that sweet assassin for me. So he now already is, under, he's smart. He understands consumer, he understands human behavior, which is why he's been so remarkable at his craft, which is why technology, though not where he spends all his time, though maybe even he may sit on the sidelines on something like a podcast or Twitter, when described properly at a higher level, he will always understand it, which is why I always, I'm always enjoying getting to interact with him about it, because I know he'll understand. I know that he just understood when he looked at that, he knows exactly what Google meant to open table. He understands. What I just did with Alexa really fucking matters. It really does. And so now what happens is, who has the leverage, right? In this scenario, Amazon has the leverage, right? It's not that Danny's firm wants to spend all this marketing money to be a paid endorsement. He wants a win on his own merit. He's got the benefit of a long, extremely well-executed branding play that has happened, but he's never gonna rest on that laurel. For 99% of the rest restaurateurs, they don't wanna be at the mercy of Alexa. That's just a Zagat 20 years later. That's just the New York Times 20 years later, 30 years later. So. Alexa, stop. So my friend, here's what I would say. I think the way to not be at the mercy of a third party is to be a tremendous communicator at scale that is current to the end consumer. For you to do what you wanna do well, you need to have a podcast and a blog post and an Instagram account and a Facebook and a Twitter and a YouTube vlog and all of the above. Can you, can you afford? These are questions everybody has to ask. But if you ask me, there's nothing more important than having the ability to communicate with the end consumer because it keeps you from being vulnerable from the technology revolution that is absolutely happening. And there's only two executions. Produce the greatest fucking product, mm -hmm. aka the man who's sitting across from me and his organization, or be the best communicator in the current moment. Or Those both. are the, Listen, that's when you get, you know, that's that's what I'm trying to be up to. You know, like that that to me is that it to me is how you end up. And by the way, this is this is history. Back to Muhammad Ali. If you think Muhammad Ali's picture of punching all five Beatles was not manipulated by two different groups that understood how media played at the time, Muhammad Ali's ability to navigate through the media landscape of the 60s and 70s is more impressive than what he did in the boxing ring. The way he played with Howard Cosell, the way he played with radio and television, the way he took photos when he had to, from the beginning, the way he said he was the greatest after he won one fight, the way he predicted, everything he did. We don't remember the 31 fights where his prediction was way off. We just remember the six or seven that he nailed. And so, I, th these are very important times because the communication landscape is changing the most since it has from the transition of radio to television and the opportunity for all of us, including restaurants, has never been greater. I wanna just add one thing to, to what you just said, which is that um, when you showed me Snapchat, yes. it just didn't register. My kids use it, you yes. use it, and I yes. said, you better listen. I said that to myself. Yes. And I, I said, I can't speak in that accent. And yes. then I got a great gift from somebody, which is this, that if you even if you accept the power of social media and telling your own stories and using it to listen and to have dialogues with people, which is great, not all of us are going to speak as beautifully in every single hundred percent language. language that there is out 100%. there. And I've come to the conclusion that I'm really comfortable with Twitter and Instagram. Yep. And that may be enough for me as long as I surround myself with others. Who are as long as you don't get caught. Expert. The only thing I would say, Dan, and you're exactly right. As long as you don't get caught only speaking Yiddish. <laughs> Oi. <laughs> That's the point, right? The what I've seen is people get very comfortable in their language to not recognize that that language is becoming obsolete and or has diminished. Which of the two of my native social languages are about to be obsolete? I think both are fine, you know. But to me. To me, Instagram is just like cost of entry in today's moment, especially in your industry. Um, Twitter's incredibly great for you and me because we really love to counterpunch. Like, I love complaints. I love when people leave negative one-star reviews of my book or, or like employees send me emails that I suck. Like, I want to fix. 
Yeah, if, I if the complaint was there, you're not better off by not knowing fix. it. Right? I want to fix. Let's sneak in one more call and then get Danny on his way before I gain 4,000 pounds. Right, and do I have something before then? A call. With? No, you're leaving now. Leave, cool. There. Cool, let me wrap it up. You're right. I can't mess it up. Danny, I love you. Love you too, Thank Gary you so v. much for being on the show. And you guys, you have an awesome team here. I'm really aware. Great, great Thank to you. work with all you guys. Well, Phil works for you as well because he's literally in <laughs> Raulino's every day. Um, uh, Danny, you get to ask the question of the day. There's, you know, over the next couple of years, this will be viewed hundreds of thousands of times. They will answer in this section. It's a good opportunity for you maybe to get, you know, a little uh, brainstorm or a focus group or just randomly want to ask a question. You get to ask the question of the day. My question of the day is... Um, in a business that has historically been a four-wall bricks-and-mortar business at a time when every human being in the world is walking around with their own personal remote control to life, also known as their smartphone, yes. where they want what they want, where they want it now, How they want it. I believe that we are still uniquely able in the restaurant industry to create a social atmosphere. But the question that's in my mind more than anything is that how can we combine what people want, which is quick, less expensive, where I want it, with the hug that we're used to giving in our own places? They're going to answer it. That camera, that good one right there. Cool. It's a great question. Thanks. I love you, pal. Continued success. Happy birthday. Thank you all. You keep asking questions, we'll keep answering them.